Every day I engage in anti-art, a violent system that is directed at uh, suppressing my imagination to perpetuate the imagination, the myths of the colonizer. Hi, this week on the Laura Flanders Show, 1,600 women of color gathered in Chicago recently to talk about the color of violence, the economy of violence, and where change might come from in our violent society. On our program, we talk with Patrice Cullors of Black Lives Matter and Kai Lumumba Barrow about decolonizing our idea of the solutions and moving beyond the state. You'll find out more coming up. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders, and I'm very excited about our next guest. Patrice Cullors is an organizer and one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. She's working right now in L.A. on the question of accountability in the sheriff's office. But there's a lot more to Patrice than that. We just played a video short, recently on this program about Black Lives Matter going to Palestine. And a whole lot of our viewers said, Palestine? Mm -hmm. I thought this was about Ferguson. Well, Patrice is just back from a 10-day trip to the U.K., and to Ireland, and she's here to tell us about it. Patrice, welcome, glad to have you. Thanks for having me. So it's true, we played this fantastic video, and now I understand you were the extraordinary choreographer <laughs> behind that dance. Black Lives Matter members there in Ramallah, and people said, huh? Explain a little. What's the connection between, first off, the movements? Well, it was important for the Black Lives Matter movement to show up to Palestine both in solidarity, but also to learn more about what's happening on the ground to Palestinians. And so it was a Dream Defender delegation, and um, myself and folks from BYP 100, uh, folks from uh, Dream Defenders, as well as um, artists actually went on this trip. And there was about 14 of us, mostly all black folks. And we were really clear that we were going to listen to what was happening, what was happening to the folks in Palestine, specifically around the occupation. And so much after Ferguson, folks spoke about, or during Ferguson, folks spoke about the sort of um, the ways in which oftentimes Ferguson felt like Palestine, mm -hmm. and uh, the level of occupation and the level of militarization. When I showed up to Palestine, I, I had already known a lot. I've been studying it for years. But I had no, nothing would have prepared me for the level of violence and militarization that the Palestinian people are under. And there was also this sort of um, kindredness that we felt with Palestinians as black people. Um, this, the constant um, sort of battering and terrorizing by, uh, by military and for us by police is uh, uh, eerily similar. Mm. And um, we thought it was important, even though we knew that it might be a huge risk for a lot of us, to show up and let Palestinians know that we are in deep solidarity with them. And frankly, we believe that Palestine is the new South Africa. Now, then you went to the UK. <laughs> Did you find eer eerie similarities there too? Yes. Yes. The UK blew my mind. I was never very interested in going to the UK. That's okay. <laughs> And so, <laughs> so I showed up um, with a huge um, open heart and open mind to hear from the folks in the United Kingdom, from particularly the black folks in the United Kingdom. And story after story was exactly the same as um, folks here, black folks in the United States. Recently, um, Mark Duggan, he's a huge case that it was very, almost similar to Mike Brown actually. He was coming home, um, driving his car, he was stopped by police. They eventually surrounded him and they shot him to death. Um, and uh, the police were just um, let off. And that was just a few days ago that that came out. And a lot of folks are saying this is so similar. Yet, what I was, I think I was most disappointed by is how much here in the US we don't know about those stories in the United Kingdom. And so I think for for me, the importance of that visit was to talk about international state violence and to talk about the ways it, in which it impacts um, both it, inside this country but also um, across the pond. And as somebody who started her reporting in Northern Ireland, I'd be remiss not to ask you about that part of the trip. <laughs> we talk about United Kingdom, yes. but it's quite different. 
in terms of policing? Terms oh, of it's Derry City is where I visited, and that it was like a liberated zone, and um, the ways in which the community of Derry stands in solidarity with Black people in the United States is incredible. We had conversations about um, uh, a lot of a lot of the northern. Irish people talked about Irish people in the States yeah. and uh, the level of racism that they've taken on here and this very intense interrogation of what it means to become white mm -hmm. in the States. And it was powerful to sort of have this very open dialogue with folks who were naming racism in a particular way. And Northern Ireland, um, I, I got to take a tour of all the murals in Northern Ireland. Um, I was there for Bloody Sunday. And so I was able to speak at the marches. and. There was such a, a deep understanding of uh, how occupation impacts our communities. Bloody Sunday when British armed forces on the streets of Derry shut down yes. nonviolent protesters. Yes. Going back to the 60s now. Yep. So let's talk about the relationship of the issues. Uh, you've touched on it, but when, when you came back, how did it change your oh. sense of what we're really grappling with here? We're in a, we have to see this as a global movement. Mm -hmm. We can't see our issues as just domestic issues. We have to see how the U.S. empire exports racism, how it exports militarization. Um, I said this a lot in the U.K. when I spoke to press, which was the United States and all of these different groups of people, they meet together often. They're not isolated and they're going over tactics together. And so we must do the same. And I think it, if I didn't make those trips, I wouldn't have understood how necessary mm -hmm. it is to call out for a global movement. And in terms of the nature of that movement, is it a movement about policing? Is it a movement about poverty? Is it a movement about the relationship between the two? How do you see it? I think it's, I think that's a really good question. Um, what I see right now, and it's because this is what I've been working on for years, is that we are in a particular moment in history where we are looking at state violence. And I think we can use this moment to look at state violence as a way to look at many other things, uh, such as poverty, um, such as homelessness. These are not unique to the United States, um, but something that is, I think, is unique is the ways in which state violence is being uplifted in this moment in history. And I think we have an opening, which doesn't happen very often, to change policy, to change the culture, and to shift some pretty deadly dynamics. Were there any institutions, whatever their success, that you saw in other countries that you think we could do with here? You know, I think in the United Kingdom, although there's still a significant amount of state violence, I think their actual process, uh, like their complaint process, is way better than ours. They were pretty disturbed at the level of um, lack of transparency that happens in this country because all their proceedings are open to the public. And so I think that there is ways in which I learned a lot from their litigators on what can be established here. Do we still have the 1033 program? Which yes. Which program by which sort of army right. surplus tanks get put on the streets of U.S. towns? That's a great question. We still have the program, except it is being monitored now because it was oh. not being monitored before. <laughs> Uh -huh. So it's which is and who's doing the monitoring? That's a great question. The DOJ is supposed to be doing the oh, monitoring, um, which the DOJ I feel like a lot of us are have lost some significant amount of trust in. And what about this question of, um, of accountability in the sheriff's department? You've talked about protests. You've talked about meetings. Do you think you're going to get it? Any sense of when this might actually happen? The civilian oversight like body. You, sounds like you have some real. So uh, we've won. Yeah, we won in December. Oh, okay. um, so we actually won the body, but right now we're in actual negotiations about what the body's going okay. to look like. And that's where it gets tricky, right? Because it's great to win a commission and an oversight body, but if it doesn't have teeth, if it doesn't have power, then we will have to protest mm -hmm. that very commission we fought for. <laughs> so that's where we're at. So how about you? Where are you at? Um, <laughs> Do you ever sort of pinch yourself and say, wait a minute, I'm negotiating, talking with the sheriff's <laughs> office in Los Angeles? Tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, you had experience, your family had brushes with the police department and worse yeah. as you were growing up. Yeah, I pinch myself all the time. <laughs> I, I pinch myself all the time. Um, this is, this, 
fight in particular is so important to me because of the level of violence that I witnessed at the hands of the state towards myself and my family. Um, from from the, my earliest memory, which was my home being raided um, with a battery ram because of the war on drugs and the, and the 1033. And so um, I remember being six years old and the police, you know, rushing in my home and searching throughout my entire house looking for my uncle at the time. And I'm asking my mother, like, why are they looking in drawers? You know, they just like totally invaded our home. Two, by the time I was 13, I had seen my entire community decimated by law enforcement. We knew the local police department. We knew the local police officer that would harass my siblings. And then by the time I was 16, my brother was incarcerated inside the county jails and was brutally beaten by the sheriff's department. And I think that's actually where my own process starts with being inside this movement. I had a lot of rage. And usually what I do with my rage is, what can I do to fix things? <laughs> How do I fix this? I didn't start the, the Dignity and Power Now when I was 16, but I did join the movement when I was 16. And I started at the Labor Community Strategy Center, Bus Riders Union, I was there for 11 years. And then from there I started Dignity and Power Now. And it's, uh, my brother's been a part of it, my mother's been a part of it, we've sat with the Sheriff's Department, and it's, it's really actually healing to sort of deal with a department that was in charge of brutalizing your family. And you're also part of the Dandelion Rising Leadership Institute, what's that? Yeah, that's one of the programs that Dignity and Power runs. It's a leadership institute for young people ages 16 to 24. We have a partnership with Youth Build Charter Schools and we've developed over 200 youth in Los Angeles. There's also you as a youth. <laughs> finding yourself homeless, pushed out of your home mm -hmm. because you came out. Yep. Our movements haven't been good at holding race and gender nope. and queerness and some struggle against some opposing, you know, some enemy yep. with the deadline. <laughs> um, all in hands and hearts and heads at the same time. Mm -hmm. How are you doing it differently? How are you managing to be all that you are? And how do you resolve that? The very same people you were fighting for were mm. the people that put you out of your home. Very good question. Um, I think so much of my life's work is about trying to figure out the whole. And part of joining the movement was my way of figuring out my whole. Yeah. You know, where do I fit in this? And the movement was my chosen family. You know, I remember go showing up to my organization and being queer and out and woman and really weird and <laughs> folks completely embracing me and also seeing that as, as important leadership uh, skills and uh, seeing a deep leader in me. And so I think what, what we're trying to do both in Black Lives Matter and also in Dignity and Power Now is see the leaders for who they are and develop them. Mm. And where does your art come into this? I have a suspicion this is where the art comes in. It's everywhere. Literally everywhere. I just actually finished a production called Power from the Mouths of the Occupied that brings uh, stories of black folks who've been impacted by state violence to stage. We had a production in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is where I started, where I did an artist fellowship with the Arca Center for uh, Social Justice and Leadership. And then in Los Angeles, I brought it to Los Angeles and uh, trained all non-actors to tell their stories. And it's, the narrative to me is the most powerful. I mean, we can sort of give statistics all day, but you, someone tells their story, you can't deny someone's story. And so that's where my work comes in. And my final question, we're talking at Insight, Color of Violence Conference, mm -hmm. taking place in Chicago this year. Angela Davis was one of the keynoters, and she talked about the economy of violence. I'm still unpacking in my mind what right. I think that means. Exactly. What did it mean to you? I think what, how, how it landed on me was really talking about the ways in which violence is commodified. Uh, the ways in which violence is packaged and the ways in which uh, violence is really um, given and produced to in, in families and churches and structures and then reproduced. Um, my, me being pushed out of my home was a form of violence and that was produced from my family's religion that then kicked me out in the streets, right? And so I think the economy of violence is actually a really important terminology for us to unpack as a movement because we can also cycle through it inside of our own uh, spaces and places that are supposed to be healing and, and transformative. Uh, we need a new economy and we need a new economy of nonviolence. Yes. <laughs> it's great to have you, Patrice. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks so much. Thanks for your work. Mm -hmm. 
What happens when a revolutionary begins a new career as an artist? Kaila Lumumba Barrow was a founder and national organizer of the prison abolition group Critical Resistance. And she's worked with Republic of New Africa, Queers for Economic Justice, Southerners on New Ground, the Student Liberation Action Movement, and many more. Well, she's now in a new phase of her life as an artist. She's launched an art and organizing project called Gallery of the Streets, and she's working on a visual opera, as she calls it, for the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. We had a chance to catch up with her and spend some time with her work recently in Chicago. So part of this project emerged out of me as an organizer and a revolutionary, working primarily around stopping uh, the prison industrial complex and moving out of that using art to kind of free my mind because there's not a lot of victories in the PIC, right? Because the system is set up to maintain its carceral system control. So I don't, I don't get to see a lot of abolition happening in my line of work, right? <laughs> so I needed ways to move through that and keep resisting and trying new things. Because the idea of abolition is a what? New thing, it's in, according to the normatives of this society, right? So every day I engage in anti-art, a violent system that is directed at uh, suppressing my imagination to perpetuate the imagination, the myths of the colonizer who will benefit from me thinking about myself and the world from his perspective, right? Am I the only one? No? Okay, good. Okay, so to try to subvert that through the art, I'm trying to see what we can do outside of the normatives, again, to address the question of absurdity, first starting with the absurdity. Police killing children is absurd. That's just absurd. That's not normal. That's not a normative, right? The fact that right now black women are the number one population being evicted. And what comes with dislocation? Dispossession. So the questions that I'm raising or attempting to raise, what I'm interested in is how do we subvert the absurd, right? Why are we addressing the absurd, which is how we are living, particularly those of us who are black and are rooted, our whole experience is rooted in anti-black violence. Why are we responding to that as if that is logical and sane? Why aren't we responding to that in the same way that we respond to absurd events and flip the script? And so the opera is an attempt to, you know, how do we like pull on our imaginations to redirect our everyday experiences. The full piece is called Echo Hybridity Love Song for Nola. And I've identified this concept or created a concept called a visual opera. The opera is composed, com composed of music, choreography, visuals, film, uh, sculpture, and uh, guerrilla theater. When I went to New Orleans, uh, right after Katrina, I made a commitment to that earth that I was not gonna let this space not be marked and recognized, because it was, it was harmful. This is, um, this is a, a triptych. This piece is largely um, contributions from 15, um, specifically 15 black feminists in NOLA in New Orleans who are going to be working on the opera. We began um, a couple weeks ago building an altar. The first piece is comprised of objects, nature, found objects and donated objects, um, and family heirlooms that uh, represents black women's resistance. And if you look, you have to look at my work kind of intricately because there's always something. I try to play with ideas a lot and use symbols to do that. So for example, she has Walmart panties. 
that have cotton in them. So what are we saying here about black women's labor? You will see uh, in her uh, intricacies, different, like I said, signs, symbols, and um, the offerings that represent our history, particularly black women's history, in terms of New Orleans specifically. I think of them mostly as domestic workers. So you see a lot of uh, symbols around domestic labor. There's a plot, and the story is that there was once a group of free birds who were in search of home. And they could not find, home was not recognizable to them. And so they are in search of home or to recreate the idea of home. The final opera will be a roving performance and installations in uh, various locations throughout New Orleans. The group of uh, black feminists I'll be working with are focusing on the movements. These are abstractions of some of the movements. This piece is movement one, Welcome to the Subversive Ball. This is movement two, and this is called, Is This Intentional Subterfuge? Question mark. And this is a, a the last one that intrigues me, I mean, they all do, but this one kind of really gets me. I don't know what it means. Bodies Without Organs, which is a, a title from Deleuze. Each of these movements will start to take shape through installations. I'm doing the prelude, which is uh, Aria of the Hybrid Revolutionary. Um, Madame Sankofa sings the blues. <laughs> And um, I'm doing the coda, the after, and that is called uh, WWFD, What Would Fanon Do? And so I'm trying to really think about this idea of transformation from a post-colonial idea, location, and using art uh, as a mechanism to help us think from a decolonial, uh, again, location. You can find out more about Kai Lumumba Barrow's project at our website. From Belfast to Baltimore to Baghdad, bad police tactics have a habit of spanning the globe. Holding police to account is a global job too, and yet it's one we tend to leave in the hands of victims' families. Shortly after the death of Baltimore's Freddie Gray, a leaked police document claimed that a prisoner transported with Gray heard him banging against the walls of the vehicle as if he was, quote, intentionally trying to injure himself. That prisoner quickly refuted that story, but not before it brought to my mind very similar claims made by police in Northern Ireland. Throwing oneself downstairs, punching own face and poking own eyes, injury to the neck by attempted self-strangulation. That's how investigators explained injuries sustained in police custody in Ireland under British rule. Human rights investigators and community activists have spent years since digging up documents that get beneath that spin. Now they can show that while they fed the public guff about self-inflicted harm, internally British ministers were sanctioning torture. That new evidence is returning attention to a case that has implications in the UK and the US too. It involves 12 men aged between 19 and 42 who were rounded up by the British Army as part of their internment without trial program and subject to hooding, prolonged stress, white noise, sleep deprivation, and deprivation of food and drink, known collectively as the five techniques developed by the British during the so-called Troubles. The last time the European Commission of Human Rights ruled on this particular case, they declared the treatment inhuman and degrading, but not torture. That 1978 ruling was reportedly used by George W. Bush's administration as justification for its infamous torture memos, and the five tactics started showing up from Abu Ghraib to Gitmo shortly thereafter. Now the Irish government is backing a call for the court to reopen the case, the families will be represented by, among others, attorney Amal Clooney. But that shouldn't obscure decades of work done by grassroots groups, like the Center for the Administration of Justice and the Pat Finucane Center. Their victory really will be ours to celebrate, too. Because an injury to one really is an injury to all. In policing, it's truer than you might imagine.
Tell me what you think. Write to me, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at grittv.org. And thanks. This week on the show, Black Lives Matter organizer Alicia Garza. Systems in this country have been not only built off of the backs of black people and, and exploited labor, but certainly have been crafted to exclude and exploit black people. And then we go to Seattle, where gentrification is moving black communities out. We're losing a piece of what we've created. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, we talk to Israeli activist Ronnie Barkin. I think that the greatest success of Israeli propaganda is to convince the world that the situation is complicated. And travel to Gaza for an exclusive interview with Professor Haida Eid. We must start fighting for civic democracy. One person, one vote. And therefore we need to come up with a democratic alternative, a secular democratic alternative. Mm -hmm.